One question that comes up time and time again is how do I connect my classic Amiga computer to a modern display? Well, the best video signal you are going to get out of this thing comes via its RGB video port. That modern display though, well, it's going to be looking for HDMI, so we need to convert between them. To date, what most people do is use an RGB discard cable, then SCART the HDMI converter. Simple enough, but it is another external box of tricks that needs another power supply. But we do now have an internal solution for the Amiga 500, and that comes in the form of a little RGB to HDMI board that sits in line with the knees. We then plug a Raspberry Pi Zero into that. That does all the conversion for us, and we get our HDMI output. Now, you can't buy these things pre-made for about £25 or so, but where's the fun in that? One thing that I definitely need practice with here on the channel is surface mount soldering, and in particular fine pitch surface mount soldering. So instead of buying one assembled board ready to go, I bought a kit. So let's see if we can't put it together. The only problem is some of the parts in this kit are... Tiny. So I think it's pretty safe to say that I didn't quite appreciate just how small 0.65 millimeters actually is. Um, this is going to be tricky. Look at all the size of the pins on them. Now I know some of you watching this would be like, I'm sure this is really easy stuff. I do it every day. Well, I don't do any of it, but. I am keen to learn because if we can put this together and if it works we can use this as a springboard to move on to bigger projects like say one of the terrible fire accelerators I could have a go at building a TF536 030 accelerator for the Amiga 500 that would be pretty cool to have but I thought we'd start with something simple like this and yes, I bought two of them, just in case I make a mess. Which, um, let's be honest here, is probably fairly likely. So I think the first thing that I'll start with is the little passives, the capacitors and resistors. These things are absolutely tiny. I'm going to have to find the tweezers and to try and help I even went to the trouble of buying brand new soldering iron tips so we need those I need to get the flux out because we're going to need plenty of that and I need the tweezers so I thought we'd give ourselves half a chance here and try and start with the bigger of these the resistors then that capacitor and then we'll try and do these incredibly tiny ones I'm going to use these tweezers here these are the sort that hold themselves closed you have to push to open so I'm hoping that will make it a little easier to hold the component in place at least I'll not have to apply any pressure to the tweezers to keep a grip of it would you look at how ridiculously small that is how am I ever going to do this well at least the tweezers hold it and I don't need to apply any pressure to it, so that's good. That, that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping this is going to make it easier. And this is R1, which is there. So I need to hold that sort of there with my shaky hands while trying to solder it in place. Right. Where's the flux? We have a brand new tip on the iron. So I've got a little bit of solder on that. And then I suppose it's just a matter of doing it. We 
Well, that's sort of down. Let me see if I can tack the other side slightly and then we can try just to uh, reposition it or maybe I'd be better trying to reposition it at the minute. Plus it is sitting up off the board slightly. Oh dear, this is not going to be simple, is it? You know what, that doesn't look too bad to me. Let's get a bit more solder on the iron and see if we can get the other side of it down. So it's not perfectly straight, but you know, it's on there. Let's see if we can do this capacitor beside it. C4. Right, so again, it's stuck down, but um, sitting up in the air. So let's see if we can push it down. <laughs> I'm not going to be building any accelerators anytime soon, sure we're not. Get off it. Right. You, sir, are sticking to that pod. Honestly, I don't know how I'm going to do those smaller ones. These are literally the size of nothing. Oh, I need three of them, not two. Let's just try and do one of these on camera and then I will try and do the other two. Somehow. Needs to go that way a bit. And then I need to try and get it down because it's up in the air again. There's a bit of a blob on that, but we'll try and tidy that up in a second. And I'm sure people are cringing looking at this, at the state of this, but... See, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm actually really happy with that so far. Yes, there's probably too much solder. Yes, it's probably not the neatest. And yes, they're not exactly straight. But they're on there. I'll do those other two. And then we'll have to tackle these three ICs. Those other two capacitors went on really easy. And I think that's just because without the camera in the way, I was able to orientate myself directly over the top of them. Then with the tweezers and the iron, just easier to see what I was doing and hold everything. But they're all on there now. Let's try and get one of these things on. Let's start here with the one in the middle. So pin one on these is denoted by a little circle, a little dot in one corner of the chip. And pin one has to line up with this corner up here. Sort of like that. I don't know if I'll be able to hold these in the tweezers while trying to do this because the thickness of that capacitor there beside it or the closeness of that capacitor beside it and the thickness of the tweezers. No, it sort of works. Yeah, I think I should be able to hold that. So we'll see them again. Get our flux in there. I haven't orientated myself very good here, have I? Because I'm left-handed. I would prefer to hold the iron in the left hand. Just going to try and get one of the pins on. And I'm not even that worried at the minute. 
If we get a solder blob or anything, I can try and tidy that up. So I think that's tacked up in that top corner there. Let me see if I can tack the opposite corner. Then we can just check to make sure the thing is sitting in the right spot. I think it is. Yes, that is one big nasty solder blob. Yeah, okay, so it is sitting in the right place. Just how are we going to solder this in? So I have watched umpteen videos on this. And what most people seem to do is just take a bit of solder on the iron and drag. I am making a right royal mess of this. Let me see if I can try and soak that up with a bit of braid. Well, I've tidied up the blob, but I'm not convinced that those pins are connected. Let's see if I can do anything with this side. I think to be honest with you here, the problem is, well, other than I don't really know what I'm doing. That flux I have, I don't really think is particularly good. There's another bridge there, for goodness sake. Right, I'm gonna to have to move the camera out of the way, try and get on top of this, and see if I can't sort it out. So it's on there, tested all the pins. There's no shorts or anything like that. Everything seems to be connected, making good connection. Um, all I really did in the end, to be honest, was just tidy up the blobs with the wick and just run the iron along everything. It certainly doesn't look like there's a lot of solder on there, but I suppose it wouldn't being such a small pitch. In fact, if we try and bring the magnification in, I'm not sure how well that's gonna look on the camera. And Apology for the glare from the lights. A bit of lens flaring for you. But, you know, it doesn't look too bad. I'm going to see if I can do these two. Okay, that is all of the surface mount stuff on. Very stressful, to say the least. I just went ahead and put on the little 3.3 volt voltage regulator as well. That was like a cakewalk, putting that on, compared to these things. But, having only done three of them in that order, um, I do think I've actually got a little bit better. That one is kind of rough. This one went on not too bad. And then this one just seemed to go on really easy. So that is all the surface mounted stuff done. It's just through hole stuff now. And you've seen me do that sort of thing plenty of times before. So I'm just going to go ahead and get all of this populated. And then we can test it in the Amiga. So I just wanted to show you quickly here. For soldering on the strip of pins to connect it to the Denise socket. I thought the easiest thing to do was to pull out the spur Amiga 500 motherboard. Stick those rows of pins into the Denise socket and just set this adapter on top and solder it up. At least that way we know everything will be lined up. Okay so that's our RGB to HDMI board built. I think it turned out not too bad in the end. And um, we've got the Pi Zero with its male GPIO header installed as well. I've stuck a 2 gig SD card in here, which is absolutely loads. The smallest SD card you can find would be plenty. And that has the software on it that you can download from the GitHub. Link in the description. So, that goes on there. Like that. But, we need an Amiga to put it in the test. And so I thought... We'd bring out 
the Mega 500 that we were working on a couple of weeks ago and see if we can't install our little board into this. So this board goes in line with Denise, but just before we do that, let's just power on quickly to double check that this 500 is still working. Don't see why it wouldn't be, but just to be thorough. Yep, that seems fine. Nothing else for it then. Let's get that chip out and get this in. And I've bought myself a new toy. A proper chip lifter. You know what actually, before we try it with the Pi, let's disconnect that. Put this in just. Hopefully this goes into this socket okay. And let's put the chip back in. And then we can try it again just on the normal RGB SCART to make sure that that side of it's still working. Then we can go to the Pi and check out the HDMI. Yep, so that still looks fine. Nothing else for it but to try this. And we're going to need an HDMI cable, aren't we? So this is mini HDMI at this side. And this is just a cable straight out to the normal HDMI. And I just have that plugged in here, just into the SCART the HDMI converter. It also has an option on it, this box, just for HDMI pass-through. That's just handier than hooking around at the back of the PC. Right, need to change this thing over to HDMI. So source will now be on HDMI. Let's go. Is this gonna work? You know what? It looks like it's working. Let me reconnect the keyboard and then we'll try the Amiga test kit disc that we wrote last time when working on this machine. So power on again. Uh, let's go for this disc. Just how sharp is that picture? That is unbelievable. Crystal clear. Right, so what I want to do is F6 for video. And I want to go F1. That is absolutely razor sharp out of the pie. Because if we just actually switch over here to the RGB, the HDMI. Now that is stretching the image on us. Just because of the way this thing is set. But... Well, that is quite sharp as well, but to be honest with you, I think the output from the Pi is just that wee bit better. Also notice that it is outputting 1920 by 1080 p so it is outputting a 16 by 9 image, but it's only displaying the native Amiga, you know, 4 by 3 image in the middle of that. There is actually an option menu you can call up on the Pi to change a few bits and pieces here. I think you can probably stretch the image and you can introduce um, scan lines and things like that. But I'm not too worried about that today. I'm still rather dumbfounded that we were able to get that working. Very impressive picture though. Very impressive. But we can't quite leave this with a long HDMI cable hanging out of it. We need to try and come up with something 
a bit more practical. So one thing I've seen a few other people do is to take a cable from the pie, run it sort of round here, underneath where the floppy drive would be, cut a hole and use an HDMI panel mount adapter. At this point, that gives you the socket that you can access from the other side. But to be perfectly honest with you, I don't really want to start cutting holes into our otherwise perfect Amiga 500 case. So what I'm going to do instead is try and make use of one of the existing holes and the one that I have personally never used, the monochrome composite output. I think if we remove that uh, socket, just pull the motherboard out of the way, then we can use that hole to feed the cable through. You see, I've picked up one of these things here. So this is mini HDMI on this point. And I have had to scratch off a bit of the rubber around this so that that fits through there. That gives us our HDMI socket then on the outside. But we just can't quite leave that hanging there like that. Sure we can't. I've came up with this thing here on the 3D printer. And the idea behind this is that that sits in there like that. It's clamped to it, sort of like that. And that will sit vertically like that. I've put a little tab on it here just to line up with one of the screw holes in the case. So we, when we screw the case back together that will hold the thing. I maybe have to put a little bit of glue on that just to hold that together. My little um, legs and holes that I uh, built into this are just a little bit too loose for it to hold together by itself. But it also has this sort of shroud on it here, which is a nice tight fit in through that hole. And the idea being, if we mount it vertically like that, you can still easily access the RGB video port as well, should you need to. But we need to get that composite port out. Now you probably could just cut it out, but I don't want to do that. I'm going to remove the motherboard from this bottom RF shield and just desolder this properly. So that is our monochrome jack removed. There it is there. I'm going to hang on to this though. And to be honest with you, I think what I'll do is try and find somewhere in the case here just to put it. Stick it down with a bit of double sided sticky tape just to keep it with the machine it came out of. Probably put it up here somewhere around where the floppy drive is. There's a lot of dead space here. But we should now be able to get the HDMI cable in. I wound up just taking the rest of the rubber off this end here. That's really just so it uh, fits through this hole a bit easier, especially the hole in the shielding, which I also had to make slightly bigger just to accommodate this. As you can see, that barely just fits through there. So we're going to bring it down that side of the capacitor there. And there should be enough length on this 15 centimeter cable for that to loop around neatly and plug in. We can then take this thing here. Clamp our cable in it like that. And this should slide in. Let me take a bit of encouragement just to get it through the shield. There it goes. Now 
and that is going to become our HDMI output. There's going to appear to be spot of super glue on that just to hold that together. But as you can see, it doesn't file the RGB port. So if you ever wanted to connect this machine up over SCART again, you could do so quite easily. Just a matter of putting the rest of it all back together and then we can give it another test. I've had a bit of a snag putting it back together. We can't put the top shield on for starters. This thing here sits too high and those uh, pins on it there from the GPIO connector would be touching this which would be bad news. But also that leg of that there that comes down and this section here would have to be cut away to allow it to fit around this. That's a bit annoying because I was hoping to um, keep the RF shield in this case but oh well we'll just have to leave this off. Well everything is back together minus one RF shield. I'm going to take HDMI this time direct from the Amiga into the capture card. One thing to point out by the way, it's only video that it carries. The audio isn't mixed into that HDMI so you do still need your RCA audio separate. Here we go. I really can't get over just how clean that video signal is. But let's test it with a game and let's pick a game that, well at the time anyway, was known for its amazing graphics. The Shadow of the Beast. Yeah, the actual game itself isn't that good, but the graphics in this and the music in this at the time were outstanding. In fact, the music in this game still is outstanding. I don't really collect big box games all too often, but when I seen this box come up, this is absolutely mint. And at the right price, I uh, had to absolutely jump on it. That cover art on that, that's just fantastic. Right, anyway. Absolutely crystal clear image. I know I keep saying it, but I really can't get over just how good it looks. Well, it's Shadow of the Beast. It looks fantastic. It sounds amazing. But unfortunately the gameplay, well, it sort of sucks, doesn't it? So I just want to see if I can notice any lag in this. Because if there's one game you need fast reflexes for, it is this one. My reflexes suck. Let me just see. Well, I mean, that does look pretty much instantaneous as I push the button. Our character is punching. So, if there is any lag introduced by our RGB to HDMI converter, it uh, it's certainly very minimal. See, how are you supposed to get past that without taking damage? This game is absolutely impossible.
Well, it does look very impressive with its multi layers of parallax grilling. Especially this. I mean, how are you supposed to get past this? And I'm dead. As I said, the game sucks. It just looks really pretty and sounds amazing. Well, there we are. We have successfully completed the RGB to HDMI mod for this Amiga 500. I know I keep saying it, but I really can't get over just how good that picture is coming out of this machine. I think it is by far the best I've ever seen an Amiga look on a modern display. So definitely worth doing if you own a 500 or even a 2000, there is a version of that board for the Amiga 2000. And I can only hope going forward that we will see other versions for the 600. 1200 CD32 and all the other machines as well. I think it would be particularly good to have one of these for the CD32 since the Wii console just fits naturally underneath the big TV in the living room. It would be awesome to get a picture like this out of it. I am going to have a go at building the other board that we have. And I've actually since went and bought some better solder and better flux. So I'm hoping it will go together even easier than this one did. And I know I said I would try and use this as like a springboard to move on to like an accelerator. I think instead though, the next logical step would be like a 8 megabyte fast RAM board, possibly for this machine. So I think I'll order up the bits and pieces I need for that and maybe have a go at putting one of them together. If that's something that you'd like to see on the channel, please let me know in the comments below. But for now, that's pretty much everything. So if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate a thumbs up as it does help with the YouTube algorithm. Why not hit subscribe if you haven't done so already. Still plenty more yet to come here on CRG and I'll see you next time.